Every great investment you've ever made started with the right connections. Connections to the world's most sought after investment community dedicated to improving business and society. You are part of this community. Welcome to iConnections Global Alternatives Conference. In eight short months, managers and allocators who control a combined 60 trillion in assets have used our platform. But as you know, there's more to our story. Funds for Food was the largest capital introduction conference of 2020, facilitating over 3,000 meetings with the industry's most sophisticated investors, while also raising nearly $2 million supporting those in need during the pandemic. We followed this with Fund Women Week, the largest capital introductions conference in 100 Women in Finance's history. Initiatives like these are at the heart of iConnection's mission. In early 2022, we will combine the latest in virtual and in-person participation at the world-famous Fountain Blue Hotel Miami. You are part of this community because you are the people with the vision to improve society. Invest in progress. Welcome to the world of iConnections. Hello everyone, I'm Ron Biscardi, the CEO of iConnections. I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this year's Global Alternatives Conference. This is our first year hosting this event, and of course, it's virtual. But we are looking forward to our first in-person Global Alts event, which will be held at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami Beach during Hedge Fund Week in January 2022. This event will feature world-class content prepared by the iConnections Investment Institute, followed by two days of one-on-one -on -one capital introduction meetings, which we project will number over 10,000. This event will be free for allocators and open to managers who are members of the iConnections platform. So if you're not already a member, please go to iConnections.io to learn more. Thank you for joining us and stay safe and healthy. Hi everyone, my name is David Wells and I'm a partner at Prosec Partners, an independent marketing and communications firm specializing in financial and professional services companies. I'm excited to be addressing all of you as a proud partner of this year's Global Alternatives Conference. The iConnections platform, through events like this, brings us all together virtually at a time when relationships and shared perspectives are more important than ever. Dynamic conversations like the one you're about to see are essential to the ongoing debate in our industry helping us to make informed decisions, share insights, and help each other. I'm excited to introduce our guest panelists, my friend Gary Cohn, former director of the United States Economic Council and former president and chief operating officer of Goldman Sachs, and Tom Bossert, former Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor, president of Trinity Cyber, national security analyst of ABC, and distinguished fellow of the Atlantic Council. Ron Biscardi, CEO of iConnections, will moderate today's session. Thank you, iConnections, and I will now turn it over to Ron to begin the discussion. Gary Cohn, Tom Bossert, it's great to have you uh, here for the first iConnections Global Alternatives Conference. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, guys, it's, uh, it's about a year ago uh, that the three of us were at my prior event in Miami talking about the crisis we were just beginning to understand, the, the COVID pandemic. And the president at the time was in the midst of an impeachment proceeding. So here we are a year later, <laughs> we've got a former president in the midst of an impeachment proceeding and COVID has ravaged you know, the globe and uh, we're still trying to fight our way out of this. So same, pretty, pretty shocking. Same president, same disease. Yeah. Same president, same disease. And, and literally history is repeating itself and we're not taking many lessons from it. So um, really good to have you back and good to be back on stage, so to speak, with Gary. <laughs> well, it, it's great to have you both here. So Tom, why don't, why don't we start with you? So you have, uh, you, you also bring another interesting uh you know, perspective to this, because this is, I believe your, is this your third? Uh, well, 
technically you're not part of the presidential transition, but you've been through two presidential transitions. So you have uh, an interesting perspective on how these things are supposed to go. Um, so, you know, given the fact that we're in the midst of a pandemic, there is now an impeachment that's going to take place. Um, what, what are your thoughts in general on, uh, on the presidential transition and what should the Biden team be focused on here in their first hundred days? Yeah, well, you know, unfortunately we saw, and I, as a, as a younger man, uh, saw the negative consequences of a bad transition. You know, a lot of what happened on 9-11, I think wasn't fully understood and could have been better understood if the transitions had happened more professionally and quickly. And back then it was because we had hanging chads in Florida and a shortened transition period, not so much two candidates uh, or two presidents that were unwilling to coordinate. And so we decided, and President Bush put his mind to making it the best transition ever on his way out so that his successor would not have the same problem. And and of course, I got to be a significant part of that and to help him out of the West Wing run that. So I handed the baton, so to speak, to the Obama team and Biden team. And uh, and I think it's still right now the model for, for how to do it right. It takes, you know, a long time, to put it mildly, and a lot of effort to not only continue to govern, but to also help the incoming team understand the decisions you're making and the rationale, because they might not come to the same conclusions, but they need to be fed the right facts and information. And so from what I can tell from the outside, it's not much of a news making statement to say that this transition was an absolutely abysmal example of what not to do. Led by the top, uh, a president who refused to admit defeat and, you know, uh, trickled down to every level. I do think there was some professionalism uh, at, the, at the department and agency level but I don't think it was anywhere near what it could have been. And the Biden team has inherited now, you know, a set of of circumstances that they're, you know, unable to, unable to adequately handle. And I think it's just a matter of time and delay. And unfortunately those are the two things that are the hottest commodity. Uh, Good news is the the Senate seems to be doing the right thing and, and quickly getting nominees through. There was some concern that wouldn't happen. I talked to the Biden team. They asked if I'd support, uh, any kind of bipartisan effort to cajole a better, faster outcome. I was 100% you know, on board with that, but it looks like Mitch McConnell and the Republicans in the Senate are doing the right thing and, and you know, getting good people in place. And you know, Gary knows better than anybody. Uh, if, you're, if you're not in place and you're running around trying to figure out where the bathroom is and how to get your phone working, then you can't get any work done. Yeah, actually, Gary, I remember uh, when we spoke at a, a prior event a few years ago, one of the things you said that was really fascinating was how starting a new administration in the White House, you literally have a thousand people, probably more than a thousand people who've never worked together before trying to come together and uh, build camaraderie and consensus and process and management systems and do all of that at light speed and for the small task of running the country. Uh, it's pretty shocking when you think about it. So how what, what do you think the impact of, of what we I think we all can agree is probably a less than ideal transition will be. Yeah, look, it it is less than an ideal transition. And it's it's a shame. It it shouldn't be this way. And it didn't have to be this way. You look, I I think Tom and I benefited from an Obama administration that tried to make sure we had a good transition. Um, So we went through a fairly normal transition. And there was a lot of documentation prepared for us. Well, maybe it wasn't prepared for us. Maybe it was actually prepared for Hillary Clinton. But nevertheless, it was there for us. Um, and we were the benefits of that. And I, and I think the outgoing White House was very open to us and was very collegial. And, you know, my former, my former predecessor could not have been um, more open, warm, and sharing of what I needed to know coming in. And, and, and I, you know, Jeff Sides, who's back in the administration, did an amazing job. But you're right that in the Trump administration, I think it's a little bit different right now in the Biden administration because a lot of this administration actually had worked together for some period of time or a long period of time during the Obama administration. So A, working in the White House is not that foreign and B, working together is not that foreign. The Trump administration, we were all foreign to um, the White House. We were foreign to federal government. We were foreign to public service a lot. A lot of us had come from a very diverse background. So it was that, that unique moment in the peaceful transition of power where we go to the inauguration, um, the inauguration festivities continue, 
And those of us working in the administration go back to the White House to start our jobs. And we show up in a White House where we're not even sure how to get in. At least I was. Tom was. Um, and we go to a conference room, the Roosevelt Room, and they hand you your computer and your ID and they walk into your office and they, they say, oh, well, welcome, um, which was a fairly fascinating experience. So we had to work together and learn together, which in many respects allowed us to um, share ideas, share thoughts, learn about each other's point of views. Where I think this administration, because they've worked together in prior years, now they, they, they may have had a four-year hiatus in the middle, um, they sort of know each other's um, points of views. They know each other's strengths. They know each other's weaknesses. So, you know, they've been able to hit the ground running, as you've seen. They've signed, I think, close to 20 executive orders in less than the first week. I don't think we would have had any capacity to write 20 executive orders in the, in the first week or month. Um, we were learning how to do that. We were learning the processes of, of doing that. Um, so it's it's clear that, that the current administration is leveraging off the facts that they were in there for eight years as vice president. And many of the people in the current White House at cabinet level or staff levels had prior experience. So uh, when you think about the Biden administration, I mean, obviously they've got they've been they've been dealt a pretty, pretty rough hand. Right. They've got to try and fix this vaccination problem. Uh, I've heard uh, President Biden's goal is to vaccinate 100 million people in the first 100 days, which would be fabulous. Um, but they have the burden of overcoming the I don't know if it's if it's misinformation or just general fear uh, of the vaccine uh, as they try to hit that goal and simultaneously uh, navigate this impeachment mess and, and frankly, the most divided country that I think we've ever seen in our lifetime. Uh, Gary, why don't you start on this one? But what would your advice be to President Biden? As to you know, what what do you focus on first? I mean, there there's a lot of fires to put out here. Well, look, Ron, there's a long list of things that have to be dealt with, and, and I'm not denying that. But but you started in the right place. Um, the, the the virus, COVID, has to be number one. Has to be number two, and then the economic fallout of COVID has to be number three. Um, and, and look, we are lucky as a country. We're lucky as a world that we actually have a vaccine. So if you play back to where we were, you know, four or six months ago, there were people saying we couldn't get a vaccine this quickly. And it was unrealistic to think that, you know, luckily we have two vaccines, maybe two and a half at this point, And we continue to have phenomenal scientific achievements by creating a vaccine and having it, you know, fairly well mass produced. And we're just learning how well mass produced it will be. And if we can get 100 million shots, now they said 100 million shots. Um, so be careful, that may not be 100 million people because some of these are two vaccines. Yeah, fair point. Uh, and look, the president went out of his way to clarify that today in the press conference, that it may be 50 million plus people vaccinated. So look, the number one priority is, is COVID. So that, that's vaccination and testing. And we've got to get that figured out. And number two, we've thrown four trillion dollars or close to four trillion dollars of stimulus at this problem. I'm the first to tell you it's not enough. You know, we still have a travel, leisure, entertainment and hospitality business. Look at us. We would normally be sitting at a very large hotel in a large conference room with thousands of people. We're doing this via Zoom. Think of all of the ancillary jobs that would have been created by us going to Miami, not just the plane rides, but the bellmen and the taxis and the, and the people cleaning the rooms and the people serving the meals and the people cooking the meals and all the AV people and the entertainment people. You thousands of jobs were not created by us doing this on video. Those jobs need to come back and they can't come back till we can all be in one place together. So to me, these are the priorities. Everything else on the list is important, but until we get the virus under control, they all become secondary. Yeah. So Tom, I'll read you a couple of stats uh, that I heard on our vaccine panel. Uh, we're actually recording this uh, late on Monday uh, and it will air early Tuesday, but our vaccine panel that aired at three 
um, Dr. Uh, Poland referenced some of these numbers. Israel has vaccinated 29 of every 100 citizens. The UAE, 18 of 100. Bahrain, 9.6. The UK, 7. USA, 4.5. Pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, and the, I think the point Dr. Poland made was that the distribution mechanism, the, the systems below the federal government level are just not strong enough in the United States to move that number substantially. What, what do you do? How, how do you actually achieve it? What, you know, other than I think it clearly, uh, you know, my opinion where President Trump missed the boat dramatically was he just didn't exert the leadership that we needed over this issue. But leadership aside, you know, that's kind of step one. Mechanically, can we actually do it? Yeah, we can. Mess- message discipline and leadership go hand in hand. And, you know, it requires a little bit of a backtracking to answer your question, just to give some new insight here. We're seeing a lot of what uh, your, your earlier panel talked about play out really on the news every day. But think of it this way. You raised the fact that we were in, a, in an impeachment transit, you know, a distraction, I'll call it, a year ago, while we were failing to miss, or failing to, to hit and rather missing this, this growing threat in front of us. Let me give you a sense of the parallelism. Right now, the concern is twofold. It's not just mitigating the existing COVID-19, which we've all gotten our heads around, I think, at this point. Although some people still you know, might not understand the severity of it, they're starting to see, even if they don't believe, that the ICUs in, in Los Angeles are full and that we're at the zenith of our, of our hospitalization levels in the United States right now. So the numbers have all borne out, the, 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 the projections have all been hit. But we're also now trying to contain, identify and contain new strains. And it's one thing if the new strains are less responsive to the vaccine. It becomes another thing altogether if they're not responsive at all. And so the British strain, this, this so-called B117 is... is is a lot more transmissible, a lot more virulent. And if you have large scale sickness, it can become more deadly because you have less healthcare capacity to treat sick patients that could be saved and otherwise might not. So you know, you've know, you got this thing seemingly responsive to Pfizer and Moderna. And then we've got the South African variant that's a lot less responsive, right? And so you've got a different number on that one. You know, um, I think it's, I, I should actually be really careful when I say this. These were strains first observed in different countries. They're not, you know, it's not the China virus. It's a strain first observed in Britain and a strain first observed in South America. But the idea of that one is that it's not responding as well to the vaccine. And stated differently, the vaccine, at least on the last test I read, Moderna, had one sixth of, you know, the, the, the response, the immuno response was, was a sixth of that, that it would be to the original strain raising serious concerns that it'll have any longevity. So what you wanna do now is make sure that we don't repeat the same mistake. Mistake in the beginning was thinking that containment and mitigation were steps. That first you did one and then you did the other instead of things you could do at the same time simultaneously. That was probably one of the largest uh, mistakes in the beginning of this that the Trump administration made. Now I'm worried we're gonna make it again Because as Gary said, it's not about testing the way we've heard the word used in the last year. It's about a specific kind of testing, you know, genetic testing, this genomic surveillance that we want to perform to allow us to separate the old strains from the new strains and to look for even additional mutations that we haven't yet identified. That's the key. And on that statistic, the United States is somewhere like 44th out of 45th in the world. I mean, we're really low on the totem there. I think we're hitting somewhere like 0.03% of the COVID positive tests with some genetic um, or genomic uh, testing capability, whereas other countries are hitting 60, 70, 80%. And from my perspective, we're gonna end up, if we're not careful, having a second pandemic for failure to identify these mutations, completely avoidable. And it's just, you know, not meant to scare your audience, but meant to frame it. The, the urgency now is, is not just on, on delivering these vaccines, But it ought to be, if there isn't already, uh, uh, driving a policy change to forget about this, you know, kind of prioritization schema. It's all about volume. I'm not looking to hit the nursing home patients first now and and causing an extra wrinkle in the distribution modeling. From, From my perspective, that's the terminal end of the transmission chain. 
half of our nursing home uh, residents have already been infected, uh, which is a terrible statistic. Uh, it means that we've never contained it in any community setting. And we continue to insist on sending kids back to school for reasons unrelated to transmission, as best I can tell. And as a result, we're going to have to not only hit that number, but we're probably going to have to double it and quickly. So, you know, it's not that I'm blaming the Biden team, but trying to set a goal for them. I hope the Johnson and Johnson vaccine gets approved in the next two weeks. And I'm hoping that they can hit their uh, delivery numbers that they've promised. If they do, we'll have a third vaccine player, which only requires one shot, not two, uh, hitting the market in May. And we might be able to buy June, July really get to that 60% of the United States population level. And the J&J vaccine, I believe, was ramped up months ago, right? So they have much higher volumes ready to go, as I they understand learned it. From the, They learned from the Pfizer and Moderna lesson that you don't wait for approval to ramp up the, the, the quantity for distribution. So they're, I mean, uh, they're, they're heavily invested at risk uh, in assuming a, an approval in the next two weeks on this emergency use authority. Yeah. Got it. So um, let's shift to uh, this issue of divisiveness, which I, I think is it's just exhausting to me personally. You know, I uh, I want to be able to go to dinner parties again and have, you know, uh, philosophical disagreements with my friends and still remain friends, which in these times, it's sad to say that's become a much harder thing to do than it ever was. How do you how do you see the Biden administration bringing the country back together? Gary, why don't we start with you? Look, Ron, it's, let's start out with the reality. It's going to be hard. You know, we, we have a, a country right now that, you know, when you look at the electorate, we had, you know, President Biden get the most votes ever cast for a president and former President Trump get the second most votes ever cast. So in essence, he would have won any other election. So, you know, they both did an amazing job of getting turnout, talking to their base and having people show up at the vote at the polls and being passionate about their position. So you start with this reality of passion um, and and you have to break that apart. And, and, And look, there's always extremes. We've always had extremes in this country. And what I think the president was talking about during his inauguration, at least I hope, and this is how I interpret it, in this idea of unity, is we have to start unifying somewhere in the middle. Um, You can't unify at the extremes. We can never unify at the extremes. But the larger you can make the middle and you can create some common ground in the middle, the more that can permeate and radiate out from the middle. You know, I find it encouraging Um, that there's a group of centrist Republicans and Democrats meeting. They met this weekend, you know, talking about areas of common interest, areas of commonality, areas where we could get legislation done during regular way legislation. So to the extent that we get legislation done during regular way and we see regular order and we see calm in the House and calm in the Senate and we get proactive legislation, I think that's the way that we have to sort of lower the temperature and get everyone trying to talk somewhat respectfully to each other. If we're in an area where we're using extraordinary methods, and, and by the way, the Trump administration used them too. So this is, this is not a criticism of the Biden administration. If we're in an area where for them to get their policy done, They have to use reconciliation. They have to work around the filibuster rule. People will feel like it's not good policy because they're circumventing the regular way or regular course order of business. But we can all sit here and hope because I do think there are a bunch of areas of common interest. And we we just talked about it. We just talked about how important it is to get the virus under control, how important it is to get vaccinations under control, how important it is to get economic stimulus to the right place, how important it is to get schools open, how important it is to get small businesses back up and running, how important it it is to have resiliency in our country. We learned about the lack of infrastructure we have in this country. There's a lot of areas where I think we as a country agree. Now, we don't always have to agree how to solve them, but if we agree on a problem, that's probably good enough for now. We'll, we'll work to a solution. 
So small business uh, is obviously the lifeblood of our economy. And uh, I, and, and they have been battered, you know, the vast majority of them have been battered uh, by this thing. You know, I, I can't think of anything that's even close. I mean, you have to go back to the great depression uh, to find anything even remotely close to what they've been through. And it's not clear. I mean, you're still in lockdown uh, situations in uh, many parts of the country, in the densest uh, areas of the country. Uh, one of the things that I struggled with under the Obama administration, and then when I would talk to other small business owners, uh, that I, I heard similar feedback was that they a lot of times they didn't feel that. I think everyone felt like Obama was a really good person and that he really wanted what was best for the country. But he didn't identify with small business. He didn't come across in a way that uh, that small businesses felt like he was really in their corner. And I wonder, I think when Trump came in, love him or hate him, I think small businesses felt like there's a business guy in the White House. And they, they felt like there, there was someone who understood how hard it is to make payroll, how hard it is to keep the lights on. I mean, people, until you've really run a small business, you really have no idea how unbelievably hard it is uh, to, to navigate all of the, the crazy situations that come up. Do you think President Biden will reach out to small business in a way that makes them feel like he's really in their corner and that he believes in them and that he's really, he, he has them in mind as he's governing uh, that, that has maybe a different tone than the Obama administration had? Gary, let me, let me take a let me take a stab at something that's inherently economic to tell you my take on that those last two questions. He has no other challenge in his presidency. That's it in a nutshell. We could go through North Korea, Iran, China, trade policy, environmental fraught you know policies with you know sar tar sands and pipelines and every, nothing but uniting this country in a way that makes them think that they have a president that will support entrepreneurship, in my view, is, you know, matters. If he can't do that, if he can't do that, he'll have continued to, to divide and the, the middle will get angry. And then I think that's where you started. I just want to jump in on your last question. Yeah. You're frustrated. To me, that means that the, the left and the right continue. And I'm not doing any equivalism here, right? The, the right has the world monopolized right now, the far right on a radical, extreme, unacceptable behavior. And there's just no other way to sugarcoat that. But eventually you'll see it, right? You'll see some form of extreme on both sides. It tends to be how it works. And the middle is mad. And the middle is gonna, gonna, get, gonna get to the point where they're so fed up that anything that sounds like a, a social engineering program is gonna really run Biden right into the ground. I think he knows better. I'm not so certain you know, he can keep a handle on, on the same influences that push every president. But if he thinks that that's his a primary concern, then he'll address it. If he doesn't, he'll lose sight of it and he'll end up an unpopular president. So, so Ron, look, I, I, I agree with, 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 with Tom that if President Biden's going to be successful, he's going he's gonna to reach out to small business and he's going to reach out to large business. By the way, this is, this is where I think we get in trouble a little bit. Every large business started as a small business. No one starts a business saying, hey, I want to be a small business the rest of my life. <laughs> Everyone starts a business thinking I have a good idea or there's a need to be served or I see an opportunity and they grow with the opportunity. So I don't care. You know, I don't care if you're a, a guy or a woman that starts a restaurant and you end up with one and you stay one or you end up turning it into a franchise or if you're a guy that can't figure out how to get home from a bar at night because you can't get a taxi when you're drunk and you start an online car service, you started because there was a need. And somehow that need, that void got filled and you took that small business and made it a big business. Because everyone in America is always trying to grow their business and grow their opportunity. And we have to embrace that opportunity in this country. And we're going to need to embrace it like we never did before, because, as you said, the businesses that have been most hurt, unfortunately, are the businesses that live day to day, week to week, which are small businesses because they don't have the financial 
safety net that larger companies have where they can lose money for a year or two because they're, they've got the stockpile of, of earnings or, or balance sheet. Small businesses can't do that. We're going to have to embrace some small businesses and we're going to have to want them to become large businesses over time. Yeah. Well, anything that he uh, he wants to do, he's going to have to get through Congress, obviously. Um We've got a, uh, you know, the Democrats control the House, but we now have a 50-50 Senate. Um, you know, I know in a prior conversation, we talked about, uh, I, I think I said, like, what happened to the days of Tip O'Neill and, you know, President Reagan just getting in a room and hammering stuff out? Uh, it, it seems like that is, uh, it's harder than ever. Um, what do you think is possible? I mean, I've heard, you know, my my liberal friends, of course, are optimistic that uh, the president will be able to push through an unwinding of the tax legislation, which, of course, you were a, a critical uh, supporter of, Gary. Um, I talked to my conservative friends. They're still terrified that he's going to pack the court and uh, and undo uh, the filibuster. Realistically, you know, what what do you think is possible? What do you think has a, a decent shot? And are, you know, are we about to maybe enter an era where we do start from the middle and uh, and Congress finds a way to work together to really come up with solutions for the American people? Well, I'll go quickly. Like Anything is possible. Like if you ask you what's possible, anything is possible. You, you have to go from what's possible to what's probable. And this is a prioritization question for the new administration. So, and and look at it like this, look at it in sort of factual perspective. If you look back at modern presidents, they historically have gotten one piece of major legislation done and they've gotten it done in their first 12 to 18 months. I think the Biden administration is gonna be fighting justifiably as a number one priority COVID for at least six to nine of those months. And that's probably as optimistic as anyone could get. Tom might think that's too optimistic. So for half of the time when presidents historically get major legislation done, the Biden administration is going to have to be dealing with and should be dealing with. And we want them as citizens dealing with COVID and COVID related things. So then it comes down to what do they want to get done and what makes sense? And, and they've got a long, 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 long laundry list. You know, we, you know, we've got COVID legislation, which is stimulus. We've got healthcare, we've got climate, we've got infrastructure, both digital and physical. We've got social issues, we've got tax issues. They have to decide what they're going to get done and what's their primary objective. Once they decide that, if it's if they can use reconciliation, if it, and there's only three things that you can use reconciliation for. You can use them for expenses, you can use them for revenue, and you can use them for debt ceiling. And I won't get to, I won't geek out on you here, but you can use them once a budget cycle. They happen to sort of have two budget cycles this year. They can, they, they have one that ends in September and one that starts in September. So literally in this calendar year, they can reconcile two different budgets they're going to have to decide what is their priority. So, like I said, they can get a lot of things done. They just have to decide what they want to get done. You know, it looks like they're going to do two things that sound awfully familiar. It looks like the first bite of the apple is going to be a welfare and a stimulus and a vaccine package all wrapped together in the form of this COVID bill. And, and I think it's what, $440 billion for communities and businesses, $400 billion for vaccines and testing, and $1 trillion for the individual and family you know, direct relief. So they'll all debate those details. And then they'll take a second bite of the apple, as Gary just described, to probably focus on infrastructure investment, which, of course, you know, we saw in the beginning of the Trump administration, it became a little bit of a meme to say that this week is infrastructure week. It always got postponed. And, right. you know, uh, Gary and I had a lot of fun with that, you know, even when the president got a little bit pissed. But the idea of it was that, uh, interestingly, the left wanted to directly fund infrastructure investment with taxpayer dollars. And the right were seeking more of a public-private partnership. And Gary will nod and smile at this. And we had a president, atypically in Trump, that was on, uh, ran on the right, was, was voting that issue. He, he was really, you know, 
I'm motivated to just take a tax and spend approach to it. Uh, interestingly, you know, now we've got a more traditional divide on that question, but my guess is the second bite at the apple is going to be a tax and spend infrastructure proposal. And we'll see if the Republicans give him any kind of latitude on that. If they do, I think he'll be a successful block and tackle manager of our federal government. Uh, if they don't, it's going to devolve into more divisive rhetoric. Ron, let me let me follow up on this, because yeah. like I said, he can get it done. Now, let's talk about the practical reality. The practical reality of all this is really difficult. And, and I, I think everyone should understand how difficult even using reconcil reconciliation, how difficult it is. Um, I'll reflect back on tax reform that I was part of. We had 53 Republicans at the time. We used reconciliation for tax reform. We had 53. It was touch and go till the last minute until literally we called the vote that night. And literally the vote took place at 1.30, 1.40 in the morning, even though it was supposed to happen during the day because we kept losing votes and people want to negotiate something and you can't lose a vote. Like literally you can't lose a vote. That was with, with we really had two extras because we knew John McCain wasn't going to support. So we walked in with 52, but think about a democratic Senate with 50. You don't have an extra. So right. you literally go into reconciliation saying, I got to carry 50 out of 50. So anything I do where I lose one, I can't do that. So every one of those 50 become a deal maker or a deal breaker and leadership, whether it's Chuck Schumer or it's the White House, is literally going to have to go to each of those senators that's a little squeaky or wants to get something or needs something and make sure they get to the finish line. So, you know, go back and I'll, I'll, I won't dwell on this, but refresh your memory. You know, we got enterprise zones because of, of Scott from, from Georgia wanted enterprise zones. And then you, once you get that, you have to go, go opportunity, accept opportunity zones. Okay, yeah, so yeah. And then you have to go back and score opportunity zones. And then whatever that costs, because when you use reconciliation, it has to add up to zero to the reconciliation structure. You have to take the money from somewhere else. Ron Johnson from Wisconsin, he didn't like pass-throughs and he wanted pass-throughs to be more equal to corporates. So we literally spent you know, three or four weeks redoing pass-throughs because we needed his vote. Susan Collins at the end of the night, she, she wanted something. You know, and, and look, none of them were wrong. I'm not saying any of those people asked for anything that was wrong, but when you don't have a vote to spare, this is how Washington works. And so Schumer and President Biden are going to have to sit there and go, OK, if we need we need these votes, this is how we're going to have to get. Them. So even though people keep talking about reconciliation, like it's just a walk in the park, it's not a walk in the park when you have 50 votes and not a spare. It's not a it's not a walk in the park with fifty three. And is this where is this a good example of where earmarks would actually help uh, the process along, and the elimination of earmarks have made it harder? I know we, we've talked about that in the past. You know, it sounds like it's against the narrative of especially the Republican Party to say that earmarks are good, but they certainly gave that kind of grist to the process that allowed for transactional deal making on a regular basis. So you combine regular order with separate you know, spending packages managed by, in theory, expert committees with, with responsible committee leadership, and then you throw in there the deal-making deal ability to have a, an earmark, and you end up with a pretty productive, although a little bit uh, you know, excessive government. However, now that we've gotten rid of it, the only thing to, to drive the debate is principle. And often our two you know, left and right sides have become so far removed on principle that they can't find common agreement. I think that they were useful, but I think there was probably a, a few more other elements around that era that, that made for some good deal making outcomes. Not the least of which is, I don't know, you know, Gary will tell me it's gerrymandering. I'll tell you it's a combination of gerrymandering and people literally voting with their feet. 
but it strikes me that we've got more red and blue states and districts now instead of purple ones. And, and that combined with the end of the earmark era has made Washington a really bitter place with no incentive structure for compromise. Well, uh, we're kind of winding down here and I can't, I can't end this without talking about the second impeachment. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, president Trump is no longer in office, uh, the articles of impeachment, I think, are due to be delivered today at 7 p.m. Uh, the trial date has been set for February 9th. Um, Tom, why don't we start with you on this one? I, I am very concerned, especially after this discussion, uh, where we've talked so much about how important it is for President Biden to bring the country together, starting with an impeachment, which I, I can't imagine how it's not going to be incredibly divisive, no matter how it goes. Uh, is this really the smartest move for the Democrats uh, if they're really trying to bring us all together? And I'm, I'm putting aside whether or not a crime was committed or any of that. I mean, you know, we can agree some bad stuff happened. But is it really in the interest of the country to spend, I don't know how long, you know, I'll, I'll assume weeks uh, for sure, engaged in this? Well, I kind of go about this the other way, right? Um, the, the House in this structure decides in their wisdom, the prosecutorial judgment part of this question, whether to or not to bring the charges. The Senate, in theory, are the jury, by analogy, and their job is to look at the uh, allegations and decide whether he's guilty or not and vote. I think if it were a factual vote of conscience without political consequence, that the overwhelming majority of senators would vote guilty. You know, the, the president led a campaign of, of falsehoods on, on a direct assault of our democracy that culminated in something that was just, you know, too hard for anyone to forget. And by the way, it doesn't help him that the jury were all witnesses that day. We've all heard that line over on TV now, but it really is important to think uh, how profound that is for him. So I'm not sure, though, how to judge the politics of it, whether it is or is not hurtful for the country. Uh, if President Biden thinks it is, I think he's, he could put an end to it and say, let's just let bygones be bygones. It might have a healing effect. Uh, and he might, in his judgment, think that's the right way to lead. But it'll have to come from him and it'll have to come from him publicly, because otherwise, on the merits, it doesn't look very good for the former president and for the people around him that uh, sought to take a narrative and use it as a weapon. And I, I will add that to my earlier answers. I'm not much of a politician. I, I tend to focus on risk management. But from my perspective, the narrative and storylines and storytelling is very powerful. And, you know, uh, we don't want to get too philosophic, but great philosophers like Plato often wanted to throw the storyteller out of the realm because the story and the narrative is very compelling, but it also doesn't often line up with the underlying facts. Gary will tell you how badly maligned his tax uh, package was. The narrative was that it was a terrible bad thing that was distributing wealth in favor of the, the ultra wealthy and so forth. Uh, but I watched him every day labor uh, in the other direction to try to, to try to remove that quality from the package. And I think he did a nice job. Uh, I'll let, I'll let him defend his own work, but you know, the narrative hasn't changed on that. The narrative's not changing on a number of other policy initiatives. And increasingly, I feel like Americans trying to get to the bottom of any proposal or any policy choice have a hard time because news organizations would rather tell the narrative story than the hard and boring issues-based story. And, you know, uh, if Biden can do something to change that, he'll be doing us a favor. Right now, the narrative on impeachment's not good because it makes half the country feel alienated and it's not good because it happened. Now, you know, don't, don't forget that, you know, the, the fact that the president engaged in that behavior makes the other half of the country feel outraged and rightly so. And then on top of it, it's a distraction from this first hundred days that are so important. So I don't know what the right answer is politically, but unfortunately the right answer factually looks pretty bad for the president, for President Trump. Yeah. Gary, any thoughts? So look, I, I think Tom just did a very good job of summarizing it. The only thing I'm going to add, and, and I'm sure Tom agrees with this, and he, he basically said it, is look, January 6th was, was a horrific day, an appalling day. 
with unacceptable behavior from the White House and the President of the United States. And, and, and there's just no denying that. And, you know, he needs to be held responsible for his behavior. Um, and he took an oath to the Constitution to protect and defend uh, the Constitution and to protect the United States and its assets. And so I understand where the House went. But as we move forward in this process, the mathematical equation going forward changes because of what Tom said. Is it a good use of floor time? Is it good use of the legislative process? And the senators have to decide that and President Biden have to decide that. I think Tom did a very good job of summarizing that. Well, great. Thank you, guys. Um, I have a couple questions that were posted in our platform. If I can uh, just indulge, if you will indulge me for a few of these. Um, how, what do you think happens in our relationship with China? How does, how does President Biden step into the ring <laughs> after COVID, after, you know, a very tumultuous, uh, relationship over trade? Um, what do you think happens there? So I'll, I'll jump on this one first. It's in my area. So it, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, in a great irony of ironies, the President Biden sat, signed a Made in America, Buy America um, executive order today. Sounded very familiar, sounded <laughs> extremely familiar to what President Trump would have signed and something he would have signed. You know, Buy America, Made in America, America First. Um, I try to say America First doesn't mean America alone. Uh, wrote that op-ed with General McMaster. Um, but it's a very interesting place. Remember, historically, the Republicans have been free traders and the Democrats have been more protectionist, protecting of American jobs and union jobs. So the Biden administration has remained fairly quiet right now on China and where we are. And interesting as well is, is we're talking about putting more and more consumer stimulus out there to help U.S. consumers, which I uh, uh, agree with, you know, one of the places you could also help consumers is to drop tariffs on Chinese made goods that we don't make in the United States because it's just a consumption tax on our, on, on our consumers. So we're giving U.S. consumers stimulus money and then they're buying goods imported from China because that's the only place that manufactures them and we're taxing them back. It seems like it's a a countervailing argument in, in, in some respects. So I, I think that the Biden administration has not come out formally on a position in China, but they've clearly come out reiterating buy in America, made in America, and that we're going to try and take more manufacturing back and prohibit more goods from coming in from China. Cool. Well, I'm going to add a quick two cents there because I agree with Gary, but the idea of, of watching an alliance-based approach work in the Middle East, I think was should have been more powerful to President Trump, and it will be not lost on President Biden. Um, I think the Chinese see an alliance of, of Western nations, not just the United States acting bilaterally or unilaterally as a terrifying thing, and it might change their more negative behaviors a little faster than, than the direct approach. And so I would imagine it's not much of a stretch to predict that there'll be uh, a multilateral engagement of Western allies primarily, but also in the region of, of allied nations that are that are really in the shadow of China, looking to the United States for some relief and, and not necessarily the ultimatum that if you don't if you don't come and buy goods from us, you can't you can't also buy goods from China. That kind of thing led to you know almost a, a completely um, neutral grist of, of halt. Uh, there was a complete uh, last time I, I traveled it was almost a year ago. I traveled to South Korea. Uh, everyone I talked to said, you know, the United States is asking us to pick and we can't pick. It's an, it's an untenable situation. Now, the second half of that is supply chain for the United States. And in my two cents, uh, we were overly centralized or overly uh, reliant on certain industries coming out of their supply chains coming out of China. So the, the, the goal should not be to onshore them, right? Bringing a bunch of pharmaceuticals uh, to the United States. It should be to diversify that supply chain in whatever way we can so that we're not really dependent on one country for really important things that I consider almost national security level in their importance. I know Gary agrees with that. 
And then lastly, there's, there's just no way to trust the Chinese on hardware supply chains that have to do with chip foundries. You know, the logical implants on a chip are almost impossible to find. It's like finding a stack, a needle in a stack of needles. And so we're going to have to come up with a way to not, not break ties with China on all areas of trade, especially not on, on low wage trade. Uh, but we're going to have to be a little bit thoughtful about, you know, this 5G, you know, break. I thought some of that was wise. So hopefully the Biden team can find a way to, to, to not claim that they're carrying on some Trump era policies, but still kind of carry on some Trump area policies there. Yeah, take, take the good stuff and leave the bad. Um, Tom, this one's definitely directed at you. How should President Biden begin his relationship with Vladimir Putin? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, again, obviously, the, I'm sure what's behind this question is the concern around Russian hacking, which uh, I know was part of your, uh, your op-ed in December. You know, the part of that solar winds hack, right? I, I shouldn't even call it that, the Russian hack of, of, right. a, of an innocent third party con- you know, company. Of course, it gave access by the Russians to so many US companies and, and government networks that it's being reported often as a past tense hack. So they hacked in the past and they got something and we just don't know what yet. But instead, what it really is, is a present danger that has to be addressed. Most of the people I know in this industry believe that a large subset of those affected networks still have some persistent Russian presence on them. It's going to be very hard to find and get them out. So what are they using it for? Well, we have to stand by and wait and see. I I believe that's Russia holding us at risk. And I think the Biden team is going to have to make clear that there's going to be a significant realm of consequences, larger than just some cyber, cyber for cyber tit for tat. So I don't want to use the reset button word or term. That that whole thing is, is kind of pregnant with a lot of history. I think the Biden team is going to have to decide what's important with respect to China, what's important with respect to Western Europe. Uh, they're going to have to decide, lastly, what they're going to do with Eastern Europe. And from there, they'll decide whether they want to uh, put some penalties in place or whether they just simply want to establish a few bright lines in cybersecurity. My guess is they're going to go bigger. Uh, you can't really sanction the Russians and the oligarchs any more than we already have. So they're going to have to find, again, an alliance of, of allies ready to collectively impart real pain onto Russia. And I think that's going to quickly head into Gary's domain. But I, I suspect that Russian oil is going to have to do with uh, a lot of it. And, and if the change in demand of Russian oil comes from a U.S. coordinated cabal, I think it'll get Putin's attention. Gary, any thoughts on that one? You know, Ron, this, this just goes back to when you look at the list of priorities facing the Biden administration. Clearly, the digital infrastructure of the country and the U.S. government has to be near the top. You know, this this is just unacceptable that we've got an arcane infrastructure in in the federal government, in the state government, and you know, then you 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 go down a little further that we learned at the lack of ability for just basic Wi-Fi throughout the country as COVID and the inequality that, that creates in kids being able to go to school remotely from rural areas, Indian reservations, non, you know, non-urban centers. You know, we have a huge need and slash opportunity to update our digital infrastructure in the United States and make it dramatically more secure. So that's it, look, that's why I say the administration is going to have to decide what on this list they want to go after because there's a, there's a there's no shortage of good things that need to be done. You just can't do them all. If we continue to think that cybersecurity is a thing to itself, I think we'll continue to fail. It has to be viewed as a as an underpinning core element of all of our operations, government operations, banking operations. It's um it's a change in thinking. I think there's some good reason to believe that the new team will understand that. And so we'll have to stand back and give them a lot of wide berth uh, room to make some policy decisions. But I've, I've kind of gotten criticism for this. It starts with a set of rules. I think there's going to be a Westphalian or, or Occidental kind of Internet. And, and those that want to be a part of it will have to meet some, some norm setting rules and some you know, show some behavior that, that demonstrate going to, to abide by those rules. And those that don't are going to be left on the outside. Any problem with that? I don't think it's sustainable to have separate internets in China and Russia, but that's the point. 
if they don't want to play by the rules, then they can have their own little uh, biased, centralized system that yeah. doesn't survive. It's really no different than a border. You know, we wouldn't accept our borders being breached. Uh, we really can't accept our digital systems being breached either. There you go. You said, it. and technologically, there's a lot of differences that people point to, but where there's a will, there's a way to make it happen. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, the last time I saw you, we were headed into Super Bowl weekend and the Chiefs are back in it. Tom Brady's back in it. Who, who's your who's your pick for the Super Bowl? Go ahead, Gary. You're going to pick your friend Tom. I know it. Yeah, you want my emotional pick? <laughs> my emotional pick's my buddy Tom Brady. Okay. Like, I, no think surprise got, there. I think he's got a big a big hill to climb. How's that? That's an, I just want everyone to know that's an emotional pick. That's not a factual pick. Factually, I think you got to go with, with, with KC by, by a long shot. But look. <laughs> Tom's a you know the the the, the big Tampa Bay first time a uh, team's playing at home in what fifty five Super Bowls, and uh, no one thought he could do it with a new team, and he's proven them all wrong. So I'm going with Tom. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Tom, I like what do you think? Just put Chiefs by seven. Yeah. Only by Chiefs seven. By seven. That's, that's, a, that's a good game. That would be a win for me. That's right. That would be a win. Well, I'm I'm in Tom's camp on this one. I got to go with the Chiefs. Well, uh, Brady's had enough. Actually, I'm going with you guys, too. (laughs) (laughs) All right, great. Well, guys, thank you so much. It was great to see both of you. I'll look forward to seeing you in person again, hopefully in the not-too-distant future. That would be great. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, Rob. Thank you very much.